things and put a smile on your face. Yes, because thank you, Ron, that, that give you a little bit of hope. This week, it's um, week two, it's snowing inside. Week two, it's, um, it's uh, week two of Advent is the Sunday when we talk about peace. All right, so I don't know if you ever have a day where you don't feel peaceful. You feel kind of wound up. You ever have a moment like that? Things are a little stressful. Your brother has a snowball. He's aiming at you. It's not very peaceful. So this week, here's what I want you to do. I have more paper for you. You still have your bags, and you're probably going to need some help this week, maybe from your parents and family. But every night, maybe at dinner, maybe before you go to bed, I want you to take one of these strips of paper, and you'll notice these strips of paper, it's, it's Christmas wrapping paper, and all put together, it talks about peace. So everybody gets one piece of paper, all right? And you're going to take it, and with your same pen from last week, you're going to write down things that if, if you're a little wound up, a little stressed, a little feeling it, these are things that you find in your life that bring you some peace. Like, if you're really wound up, can you think of something that gives you peace? What? Video games. You would write video games on there. All right, good. Video games. Can you think of anything that unwinds you? I think that would wind you up, not wind you down. So maybe a little space between brother and sister might give you a little bit of peace. Here are some of the things I wrote down. I wrote down one thing for every day, all right? Holding Jack. Jack is our cat, and Jack doesn't like to be held, but every morning when I get up, when the house is quiet and no one can witness it, Jack will cry to me. And as long as I'm standing, he'll let me hold him for about 20 seconds. And then he wants to go away, and he'll see me again tomorrow morning. But you can't sit down with Jack. He doesn't like that. But he'll let me hold him for about 20 seconds. That gives me peace. Same thing with the dog, although the dog isn't reluctant. She likes it when I pet her head. And I love it when my dog comes and sits on the couch with me and puts her head on my thigh, and I just pet her. Wrigley's a good dog. Um, John Denver, a name you probably don't know, but he's this really great musician, and I have something else that you really don't know about probably, records and a record player. <laughs> and when I'm wound up a little bit, I just put John Denver music on, and I turn the lights down in the house, and I just sit and I listen to, to John Denver. Um, sitting in silence in front of the fireplace, with a fire going in the fireplace. That gives me peace. Um, a conversation with a close friend, especially if it's at a Starbucks coffee place, because that's another one. Coffee. A warm cup of coffee, a hot cup of coffee gives me peace. And the last one, getting outside and walking. Those bring me peace when I get wound a little tight. So this week, just try to write down one thing for every day on your paper, fold it up, put it in your baggie, and you can bring it back, okay? Boy, that snow, it's tempting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me pray for you guys. God, I thank you that you knew that we would have um, times when we would need peace. And so you give us things that bring peace. Sometimes it's just sitting in silence. Sometimes it's getting outside and taking a walk or a hike. Sometimes it's playing video games. Sometimes it's a dog or a cat. Thank you for knowing that we were going to need peace and for giving us things in our lives that bring peace. Um, as we look at, at peace today and our preparation for your coming as our Savior, will you help us to see that you are the, the, the meaning of peace, you're the bringer of peace, and that you bring peace to the inside of our hearts, not just to the outside. Thank you for these children and for the snow. Amen. Thank you, guys. seated. You don't mind if I pray before we open God's word? I don't really understand, God, how um, you can inspire 
the words of scripture thousands of years ago and how it can have perfect meaning thousands of years ago and then in 2017 it can have perfect meaning for us too. Our world is so different from the world of the Israelites. We're not in the middle of 300 years of Assyrian and Babylonian and Persian um, captivity. We live in the Western Hemisphere. We live in a modern world. And yet we need exactly what they needed. We, needed, we need hope and we need peace. And, and we need you to come as our, our redeemer, our savior. So I'm not really sure how you make um, the truth of an old text meaningful to us, but I thank you for it. I thank you for the needs that we have because they, they draw us to you. Will you please speak through um, the Holy Spirit, through the, the words of Isaiah in chapter 40, um, to the needs that we have that are very current today? We pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You know, the cause may change, but the solution is the same. If we were here for a wedding today and the back doors are closed and we're about ready for the bridal processional, the bride is right behind that door, um, hand on the arm of her dad, and what's the advice that he gives to her? Take a deep breath, right? Uh, you can change the situation. It's um, one second left on the clock, tie basketball game, and it's a foul, and a player goes to the line to shoot. What's the coach say to him right before he goes to the line? Take a deep breath. Uh, my daughter has two young boys. They're toddlers, almost three, almost two. And they're good boys, and they're brothers, and they are toddlers, and they know it's mine really well. And they will fight over a toy that doesn't belong to either one of them. And what does Ellen do in the middle of that situation? She separates them, and she says, all right, both of you, take a deep breath. You're in the mall. I don't know why you'd go to the mall, but you're in the mall with 2,000 other people. You're running out of time to buy the perfect present. You had the perfect present in mind, but of course it's been sold out a long time ago, and 2,000 other people are in the same dilemma. The stress level is high at the mall. What do we say to all 2,000 of you? Take a deep breath. If you were here with us last Sunday when we started our Advent celebration in Isaiah chapter 40, we read the words of the prophet. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 40. That's where we need to be. But as, as we start Isaiah chapter 40 and we're looking at Advent number one, the, the Sunday of hope, what do we hear? Comfort, comfort my people. And we, we looked up the Hebrew on that and that word comfort that he says twice literally means take a deep breath because hope is coming. I want us to go back um, as we continue through our, our Advent time of preparation and I, I just want us to read down through Isaiah chapter 40, the first few verses. And I, I just want to remind you what you already know. Advent's just a time of preparation. We're preparing for the coming of Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, Redeemer to our 2017 world. And, 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 and I just want to say to you, as we anticipate the celebration of the coming of Jesus, take a deep breath. We're celebrating Jesus coming. Take a deep breath, um, relief is on the way. Take a deep breath. We live in a world where our need of a savior is at an all time high. Take a deep breath, comfort, comfort my people. Let me read to you Isaiah chapter 40 verses one through five. Comfort, comfort my people says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed for all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Today's the second Sunday of Advent, and we're in verses 1 and, and, and 2. It's take a deep breath. There is hope on the way. Verses 3, 4, and 5, it's, it's all about peace. I want to show you the, the, the peace that comes when you don't feel especially peaceful. It's the preparation that we do to have the peace come 
when you don't feel especially peaceful. Uh, in the Hebrew, the, the, the image that Isaiah is painting in verse 3 is this image where when a monarch was preparing a visit, he would send messengers and attendants ahead of him. And they would make sure that in between the palace and the place where he was going, they would clear the road. If there were branches on the road, they'd get them out of the way. If there was a boulder that had rolled down on the road, they'd roll it out of the way. They would prepare the road for the coming of the monarch. And in this case, in Isaiah chapter 40, just, just realize this. It's the coming of Jesus. This is prophetic to the coming of the Prince of Peace. So before the Prince of Peace comes, before he departs on his journey to come, the attendants come ahead of him and they clear out the road. They get rid of the, the, the debris that's in the road. Um, it's kind of like this. Um, do you remember that stage of life when your kids were toddlers? And you went through, um, I think it was about seven or eight years when your house was constantly cluttered. Because people buy toys at Christmas like every kid needs three dozen toys, right? You get a couple of toddlers in the house and each one of them owns three dozen toys, your house never looks clean and nap time comes. And you want to take a nap too, but first you say, I just have to see if there's really carpet on my floor. And so you spend 10 minutes getting all the toys back in the toy box and it's great for the hour long nap. Five minutes after the nap is over, all three dozen toys are back all over the floor. Take heart. This stage of parenting only lasts five to ten years, and, and you'll find your carpet again. Or, or how about this one? This one might hit a little closer to home. Um, it's 2017, and we're going to have the outdoor service at the DeWitts, and they have their yard ready. It is great, and Ohio does what Ohio does probably best in July. Thunderstorm with 60-mile-an-hour winds. Let's drop four trees on their property and throw um, tree debris everywhere, and the picnics in three days. That's the picture. That is Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. You got tree debris down everywhere. Prepare the way for the Lord. We need to get that debris gone because the Lord is coming, all right? That's the picture that, that, that's uh, in Isaiah 40 verse 3. So let's start to put it together. Verse 1, take a deep breath. Hope is right around the corner. Then verse 3, after you take that deep breath, go get your chainsaw because there are things that are causing the, what used to be a peaceful world for you to be a very unpeaceful world for you. And you need to get your chainsaw out and you need to cut it up. You need to cut the, the big limbs and get them off the road. You know, that really brings up a, a question for me. If I'm in my, this is my little dream world, if I'm in my log cabin on my 20 acres down the one long lane, and in my, in my little dream world, there is forest on both sides of my long lane because I want to be isolated. And if in fact that there has been this horrible storm that's dropped tree limbs all over my one road, and I know help wants to come but help can't get there, what are those tree branches that are preventing the help? That's how I picture it. Well, for me, it's stuff like this. Here's a tree branch, a big one. Sin. Why is it that, that, that I and you are drawn to things that, are, that we know are so bad for us? I mean, I say it a lot, although I've come around on Brussels sprouts, because I can't sit on Brussels sprouts anymore. I finally like them. But lima beans. I'm not tempted to, like, overeat lima beans. But dessert? Potato chips, coffee, oh yeah, tempted all the time, give in most of the time. Why is it that we are so drawn to things that are so wrong for us? And I'm not saying all that stuff is sin, but it's easier to talk about sin when you call it chocolate cake than when you call it what it really is, right? Why is it? Well, what we've got to do is we've got to get the chainsaw out because as long as we have sin that we know about in our life and it's unconfessed and we keep going back to it, that's a limb that's preventing the Prince of Peace from getting down the long lane to our, our log cabin. You know, sometimes we get the chainsaw out and we get rid of the, the sin and we confess it and God forgives us. He's so gracious. But then we're left with the guilt. Here's something that I just don't understand. I can't remember what I had for dinner three nights ago but I can't forget what I did that was sinful and shameful three years ago. Why is that? 
Why is that? We need to get the chainsaw out and cut that up and say, God, you've forgiven me. Why can't I forgive me? I need to cut it off the road and, and make the path clear for the Prince of Peace. How about this one? Doubts. Uh, you know, it'd be so much easier if when I went out to get that little jar of snow, if in my place Jesus just walked in. It'd be a whole lot easier if Jesus would just do a little question answer session once a year with us and you can ask any question that you don't know the answer to because there are a lot of questions that I have about God like this one. God, I believe that you are essentially good. I believe that you're a God of love. I believe that you're almighty. I believe that you're sovereign, that you're in charge. I believe that you have my best interest at heart. And yet I turn on the news day after day after day and I see 17,000 acres on fire in California, 700 homes burnt, and that was the update from yesterday, and it looks like they're gonna have another horrible week of total devastation. And I can't help but ask the question, God, where is my loving, all-powerful, sovereign God in the middle of that? People are losing their homes, their livelihoods, some of them their lives. When grief creeps in, especially when it's unexpected and blindsides you, that brings up a whole bunch of doubts and questions and where is the powerful God in the time oh boy need to get the chainsaw out need to cut up those doubts into smaller chunks and deal with them and ask Jesus those questions you know that's nothing new those those branches that that cross the road for us that are in the form of hard questions um, do you remember when Jesus was walking around on earth a man came up to him and he said Jesus my son has a demon and the demon keeps um, like throwing my son down on the ground sometimes into flames sometimes into water as if to drown him Jesus will you deliver my son and the, the man actually says if you can will you have pity and deliver my son and Jesus almost takes offense to the if you can and Jesus looks at him and says if I can you just need to believe and the man responds with this a statement that I can relate to, I think some of you can too. I, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. Doubt is a branch that crosses the road. And we're down that lane with, you know, with our, our, our little log cabin, and there's only one road in, and sometimes doubts and questions, will, you know, we just need to get the chainsaw out and talk to Jesus and say, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Now, there's a chance that this whole metaphor of the cabin down the path just isn't cutting it for you. Uh, maybe you're just not relating to that because you're like, what do you want to live down a long lane of, surrounded by 20 acres for? Let it be my dream, okay? But Isaiah changes his metaphor, but he doesn't change his message. In verse 4, he changes his metaphor and he says this, every valley will be raised up, every mountain will be made low, and the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. His message is the same, but his metaphor just changed. And his message is this. Maybe, maybe what you've got is you're on this mountain peak, and you're looking across, and you see the other mountain peak, and you know that's where the path's going, but in between you and, the, uh, and where you want to go, there's a valley. And that valley for you might be issues with God. And you go, man, I don't, I don't understand what you're doing, God. I just don't get you. Isaiah says, here's what's going to happen. God's going to elevate the valley so it's level with the mountain peak. And then he flips the other side and he goes, all right, and he's going to bring the mountains down. So maybe what is the mountain for you is there is so much you don't understand about God. There's so much you don't understand about the 66 books of Scripture. There's so much that you're, there's a mountain of stuff that you don't know. God says, we're just going to bring in bulldozers. We're going to level this whole thing and we're gonna make the path really smooth because peace is going to come in verse five. Look at verse five. Once we get the mountains down and the valleys up and we just have this level path for the coming of the Prince of Peace, watch him come in verse five. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Do you know what that moment is? When the glory of the Lord is revealed and all mankind together will see it. Do you know what it's talking about? When Jesus came. I can't climb the mountain high enough to get to heaven. 
I can't answer all of those valley of doubts to get myself in the presence of Jesus. So Jesus comes to us. As the Prince of Peace, he levels the mountains, he raises the valley, he makes the road smooth, he gets the chainsaw out, and he cuts through all of it. And he comes to us. And he goes, okay, Emmanuel, God with us, I'm going to come to you. And I'm going to live with you for 33 years. And I'm going to feel what it feels like to be you. I'm going to feel the pain of getting sick and having dry heaves. I'm going to feel what it feels like when one of my friends, Lazarus, dies and I go through the grieving process with their family. I'm going to feel what it feels like to be desperate when people can't be healed and I have to step in and heal them. I'm going to feel what that feels like. I'm going to be Emmanuel. God with us, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed in Jesus. And all mankind, Jews and Gentiles, will see Jesus. And how do we know it, it, it's going to happen? Because the mouth of God said it was going to happen. So Jesus lives 33 years on earth, living our existence. Emmanuel, God with us. And at the end of his life, he goes, and now it's time to tender my life for your redemption. And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate communion. The death and resurrection, the shed blood of Jesus. And we symbolically internalize it. Because that's where our Prince of Peace becomes the reality of peace for us.